thank you so much, Zoe, for being with me today and for being part of our Speaking Truth to Youth project. I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you to talk about. The first yeah. one is, what in your youth led you to become an activist? When I was young, I was very sensitive to injustice and cruelty, but I didn't grow up learning that I could really do anything about these things. I grew up being primed to have a career and a profession, but not to change unjust or unsustainable or inhumane systems. I, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s uh, during the Vietnam War. I would see the protesters on TV. I admired them, but I didn't feel like I would be them. So when I was 13, I started watching Star Trek and Star Trek tr utterly transformed my life in many ways to this day. One episode, Mr. Spock, the logical Vulcan, happened to mention that he couldn't understand how humans could eat meat. He was a vegetarian. That was such a strange moment for me. I always loved animals. And he made this comment, and I never saw my own complicity in systems of harm. They were always out there. So I thought, well, I should probably become a vegetarian. So I said to my mom, I'm thinking about becoming a vegetarian. I loved meat, so this was going to be a sacrifice on my part. And then I just sort of added, but but I guess they're already dead, right? So it doesn't really matter. And my mom, she didn't want me to be a vegetarian, so she did not disabuse me of this faulty logic or explain the laws of supply and demand. It took another seven years before I became a vegetarian. I needed to understand that my choices mattered, that I had I could play a role just by my very choices in contributing to less harm and suffering and destruction in the world. So when I was in graduate school and I was looking for a summer job, uh, I'll just go back a little bit. I read the book Animal Liberation by Peter Singer, which introduced me to all the different ways that we humans are causing suffering and harm to animals. And that, because I loved animals, I was very sensitive to that. But I had been very, very, very upset about racial injustice when I was in high school. And I had been an ardent feminist from middle school on. I mean, when my mom told me at the beginning of high school that she wanted to teach me to cook, I said, well, you never taught my brother to cook. And he was more than four years older than I. I'm like, no, like that's just, just that kind of blatant sexism. I was going to have none of it. Uh, so anyway, I read Animal Liberation these years later, and I realized just uh, so many aspects of my life were complicit with animal cruelty. So when I was in graduate school and I was looking for a summer job, I found this program at the University of Pennsylvania that offered week-long courses to middle school students. And I pitched a whole bunch of courses to the director of that program, and one of them was on animal issues. As I began to find out about these issues and I wanted to do something about it, I contacted an animal rights organization. They told me about leafleting events in my city. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. And I hated every minute of it. I People would walk by me. They wouldn't take my leaflets. Sometimes they'd take my leaflets and then drop them on the ground 20 feet later, littering. Some One person told me to get a life. I mean, I just, it made me so mad. And I thought, if this is activism, if this is what I need to do in order to create change, I'm not going to last doing this. So I pitched these courses. The director said yes to all of them. And the Animal Issues course was the second most popular of the 60 courses offered that summer. Because Kids love animals. And I taught about what was happening to animals. And one of the things that I taught the students was about product testing, where everything from cosmetics to shampoo to oven cleaner are dripped into the eyes of conscious rabbits and force fed to them in quantities that kill and smeared on their abraded skin. And one boy went home that night and he made his own homemade leaflets. Now, this was in 1987. He did not have a computer. He could not print them out. He hand wrote these leaflets. And he came back to class the next day and he wanted to hand them out on the street. So while the rest of us were having lunch, he was on a Philadelphia street corner handing out his homemade leaflets. 
he'd become an activist overnight in that fairly traditional way that I had abandoned. But that's the summer I found my form of activism, which was education. And that turned into my career. I became a humane educator who taught about the interconnected issues of human rights and environmental sustainability and animal protection with the goal of educating students to be solutionaries who had the knowledge and the skills and the motivation to identify unsustainable, unjust, and inhumane systems and transform them in ways that did the most good and the least harm for everybody, for people, for animals, and for the environment. That's what I've been doing ever since. I don't actually call myself an activist. I'm not upset if people call me an activist, but I call myself a solutionary. And not all activists are solutionaries. What continues to guide you and give you courage and hope? Hope is, is uh, it's an interesting thing. My favorite quote is one that, you know, I re I've repeated in my head for decades. And that comes from Joan Baez, the singer-songwriter, who said, action is the antidote to despair. Professor David Orr, who's a professor at Oberlin College, he has this very poetic way of describing hope. He says, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. And Greta Thunberg, the climate activist, says, once we start to act, hope is everywhere. Much of what keeps me going doing this work, I mean, I, I've been a humane educator trying to create change, change the educational system, help people become solutionaries. I've been doing this for a really long time. The reason I, I am, I stay in this work and actually can't ever imagine myself retiring is because I want to live with integrity and I have to look at myself in the mirror every day. And I want to have respect for the person who's looking back at me. I don't want to die one day and feel like I didn't try to make this world a better place. It's just not sufficient for me to think about satisfying my own personal desires if it's not also contributing to making this world a better place for others. I don't think I have a lot of courage. I have a lot of compassion. I have a lot of discipline. I'm very honest. And integrity is really important to me. And for me, those qualities can maintain my motivation to do this work. I would say to anybody who is thinking, what do I want to do to make this world better? Is literally ask yourself, what values are most important to you? There are a lot of virtues out there. I don't have a lot of patience either. It's not one of my virtues. I don't have a lot of equanimity. That's a really great virtue for being an activist. Because if you want to be a solutionary activist who is not easily riled up by what can be really difficult situations, well, equanimity is an important quality. So what are those qualities that are most important to you and which ones do you have and which ones can you capitalize on? What advice do you have for, specifically for young people? I love the question because that's who I love teaching is young people. So I have a lot of advice. In addition to that question about what are your values, it's really important to ask yourself what issues really concern you? What problems in your community in the world, in your neighborhood, in your country, do you really want to solve? Start there. And you don't have to pick the biggest problem, the one everybody's talking about. You have to pick what's most tugging at your heart and making your mind whir. The next question to ask yourself is, what are you good at? Now, if you're a young person, you may not know all the things you're good at. I'm 62. I don't know all the things I'm good at. You discover these things over your lifetime, but you probably know some things you're good at. And I'm not talking about just the things that are measured in school. I'm not talking about whether you're good at math or you're good at writing an essay. You might be good at making friends. You might be good at making music. You might be good at athletics or you might have a lot of equanimity and patience you might be good on computers and with technology. You might be artistic and great at making videos. Whatever it is that you've not begun to notice that you're good at, just pay attention to it. The third question is, what do you love to do? So you could be a really good at playing the piano and not really love it. 
You could be somebody who loves mm, taking pictures. You could be somebody who loves reading novels. Whatever it is, think about all the things that you love to do. Think about all the things that you're good at. Think about what you care about and see if you can find the place where they all meet. So let's say you love making videos and you're really concerned about racial justice issues and you're also good at making videos. You could put those things together and you could put a video on YouTube that gets 10,000, 100,000 people watching it where you educate people through that. So asking those questions and finding the places where they meet and then continually asking because you're going to find more things you're good at and you're going to find more things that you love to do is why I'm not leafleting anymore and why I became an educator. I found out I loved teaching. I was good at teaching and I could teach about the issues that I cared about. And it was such a win. Find your win, win, win. As you look at today's education system and, you know, schools and what teachers are facing and reliance on test scores and all of that, how do you see helping that change to kind of more of what you're talking about? I wrote, I wrote my book, The World Becomes What We Teach, Educating a Generation of Solutionaries to jumpstart this change. And at the Institute for Humane Education, that's what we've been doing. We are working with teachers. We are working with schools. We're working on every continent except Antarctica in order to transform what happens in classrooms. I think we need to look at the mission statements. We need to look at professional development. We need to look at how we train teachers. All of that has to come together synergistically and you know, I think we might be getting close to that point. Teachers are leaving the profession in droves. Very, very small percentage of young people, college students, want to go into education. This is a crisis. At the same time, we are seeing epidemic levels of youth anxiety and depression. Our education system sometimes feels to me like the dinosaurs just before the asteroid struck, like we are going to have to shift. So much is available now for learning about content. You know, pretty soon every student is going to have their own artificial intelligence tutor. We don't need to focus on content. We need to be able to cultivate dispositions and thinking skills. We need to be able to have students come together collaboratively to use the academic skills that they're gaining, literacy, numeracy, science, critical thinking, systems thinking, research. We can use school as the place where we come together and we learn the content we need to learn. We learn the skills we need to learn in very innovative ways and we apply them. And as we apply them, education just comes alive. Students are engaged. They are empowered. Everything about the learning endeavor feels meaningful and purposeful. It's a simple vision to transform our education system, but the system is so entrenched and yet we're seeing all the problems. And the other thing that I would say about why I think that the timing may be right is the polarization in our country and other countries is so intense. And what's that? what that's doing is we know that teachers and administrators, schools are afraid to talk about any controversial topics. Some are forbidden uh, from talking about controversial topics. And yet the solutionary framework is actually the antidote to polarization because it, instead of becoming a contentious either or debate, what the solutionary process invites us to do is to identify an actual problem that we can all agree is a problem and then work together to solve that problem through research and critical thinking and systems thinking. And it requires that we talk to all stakeholders. So it requires that we reach out to a variety of people who have different perspectives. That is the answer to polarization, come together and solve actual problems. And right now we are at the mercy of a media system and a political system that keeps manufacturing crises that are not real crises. Like which bathroom a transgender student uses is 
is a manufactured crisis. There is no evidence that whatever bathroom a transgender student uses, has there are any safety issues whatsoever. And there have been studies of this. You know it's a real crisis? The transgender kids have high rates of depression and suicidality. When we can actually examine what are the real problems and how can we address them and come together to do that and debate, debate them only in the sense that we are debating how to solve them, not debating like who's right and who's wrong. I think that, I think we're getting there. Thank you so much. So this, thanks a lot.